perhaps the most famous Chinese emperor is uh, the first emperor from the Qin dynasty. This is 3rd century BCE, and his name is pronounced Qin Shu Wang. We're going to call him the first emperor. By the time we get to the period of the first emperor, we have already consolidated the earlier belief systems of ancestor worship and nature worship. We also have the teachings of Confucius, as well as the teachings of Lao Tzu, or the teachings that accompany the beliefs of Taoism. All of those are present at the time that the first emperor is living. And in one way or another, his creations, uh, as well as his life, reflects beliefs in all of those systems. Okay, first of all, uh, he will, we understand, uh, destroy the writings of Confucius uh, in the libraries because he did not support the ideas of Confucius. Confucius in particular reinforced the notion of the mandate of heaven. The mandate of heaven and heaven represents an impersonal divine force. Heaven accepted and supported only virtuous rulers, rulers who took care of their people in, let's say, a gentle way, following the ideas of Confucius, that it was the most important quality of a ruler to be virtuous. The first emperor did not approach rule in that manner. He used perhaps, I'm going to say a heavier hand, in his attempt to create liter quite literally the first empire of China. Consequently, he did not support Confucianism. And it was a period in which Confucian texts were destroyed, and it is said Confucian scholars were literally buried alive. It is also a period, though, that um, was one that encouraged Taoism. And we believe that the first emperor embraced Taoist beliefs and practices, particularly the idea of seeking the land of the immortals and seeking immortality as a part of Taoism as a religion, a number of potions or elixirs were developed, which were believed to f change your physical composition, to actually allow you to become immortal. And we think that the first emperor was being treated with these elixirs of that were Tao in the hopes of living forever. We also know that these elixirs contained, at least some of them, contained mercury. And it is our understanding today that in fact the first emperor died because of his consumption of Taoist mixtures with mercury in them. In other words, his quest for immortality, we think is what killed him. We also know and understand that his tomb which is very, very high, was originally planted with trees and grass on it, and that it resembled a mountain. Again, going back to the ideas of reaching up to the heavens and to being as close as possible to the divine. The first emperor's era then, third century BCE, does illustrate in one way or another all of the fundamental beliefs of ancient China. Uh, he is an incredibly important figure. He unifies China. He conquers the warring warlords, the individual essentially rulers, unifying China into a single country, uh, a single empire. And one of his accomplishments will be to link the pieces of the Great Wall of China together. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of the Great Wall in a minute. Uh, he, however, ruled rather harshly. He used a system that was referred to as legalism, not believing that we were inherently good, but assuming that we were inherently bad and needed to be directed by a firm hand. That did result in turning away and rejecting the believing the, the teachings of Confucius. Uh, this, of course, is the first emperor's army that we're going to take a look at, and it is illustrated in O'Reilly. Uh, before we do that, I do want to remind you that uh, the guy was pretty impressive in his unification of what we consider to be China today. And one of the things he did was to piece together the segments that had been put up by local rulers of the Great 
wall to keep quote unquote barbarians to the north away from uh, marauding China itself. The wall today that exists uh, is not the wall that was constructed by the first emperor. It had to be refurbished to be rebuilt in later times and most of the wall today comes from the Ming dynasty in a later period in Chinese history. Nevertheless, we give credit to the first emperor for initially linking the pieces. Uh, today, approximately 4,000 miles, that's not too shabby for a wall. This is figure 4-8 from O'Reilly and it's a view into uh, one of the pits. This is usually called pit one. Uh, there were uh, three burial pits for around 8,000. I'm going to say life-size, but if I stand next to them, they tower over me. Some of, I'm five feet, some of them going up to six or perhaps just a tiny bit more. So that these are substantial large-scale figures, at least intended to be life-size, uh, if not more. Uh, all made out of terracotta all in battle ready formation to serve the first emperor in the next life. Uh, pit one uh, contains 6,000 of these warriors. These are standing men with horses. Originally they had weapons so that they could perform their operations on the battlefield. Uh, they have a line of soldiers both at the front and at the rear, rear guard, and uh, soldiers who are intended with long range weapons at the front. And then two rows, there are 11 tunnels basically that have been dug into the earth where these soldiers are located. The two on the side are facing outward slightly so that they can protect the flanks of the soldiers. In other words, this is a standing army as the standing armies would have functioned in the day of the first emperor. This is a view of the advanced guard right here. The soldiers that would have been at the front of the military body itself. You can also get a couple details here, a horse as well as one of the soldiers. You can see that they're naturalistic, but at the same time they're somewhat generalized, and I think we can safely say that they have been idealized as well uh, in terms of youthfulness and vigor. These were all buried in trenches uh, approximately 16 feet deep that originally had a wooden roof constructed over the top and then earth on top of that. However, shortly after the death of the first emperor, there was a rebellion and this particular mound was actually sacked. Uh, Fire was set to the roof, it caved in, a number of the soldiers toppled over, and a number of the weapons were taken. We're looking into pit three. This was the elite command unit. You could say the generals if you wanted to do that. Uh, as you look at my photograph, you can see that the heads are missing in this particular picture. That also tells you that the heads, uh, wait a minute, I've got a head for you right here. Uh, that also tells you that the heads were made separately and placed on the bodies of these figures. Uh, originally, we believe that they were all facing a central area. Animal bones were found there. And it is conceivable that those animal bones represent a divination act. In other words, trying to determine by looking at the remains of the animals if it is an appropriate day to go into battle or not. Uh, all of this is located, these are the pits. Uh, this is pit one with the 6,000. This is the generals. And this is a pit that held uh, archers and charioteers, uh, perhaps an elite unit within uh, the standing army of the first emperor. Uh, the largest one would be the infinite infantrymen, uh, the foot soldiers basically. And then this is the burial site with the burial mound for the first emperor. This is one of the archers and I believe this came from pit two. If you take a look at the hands of the figure over here, you can imagine as he kneels, he was actually holding a bow. Each of these individual military men uh, assigned to a different task, for example, the archers, had specific hairdos and specific military uniforms, which designated their rank and essentially their occupation. All of these were 
originally uh, fired, or excuse me, uh, painted after the firing. The paint on the surface sadly was fragile, so we don't have much of the original left. Uh, you can see a little restoration work taking place in the lower right, and I think this is on one of our archers. The Chinese have done a pretty good job of restoring uh, or copies to what the originals might have looked like by taking paint samples and matching them from some of the original pieces of sculpture. So on the left, what you're looking at is a Chinese replica that will give us a good sense of what this might originally have looked like back in the day of the first emperor. Fairly richly colored on the surface. This is our archer again, and if you look at his padding, uh, he has armor essentially to protect him on the battlefield as he needs in a battle ready position in order to engage uh, the opposition to the first emperor. You can also see his unique hairdo, unique to the archers. And again, you can see work being done on uh, up here on one of the originals. This was an amazing task for the Chinese to uh, excavate and to carefully restore. This is what this looked like in various stages of the excavation. It'll give you a little bit of a sense of why we're saying approximately 8,000 figures, uh, which is a huge monumental undertaking. And you might be wondering, well, how did they ever manage this? Well, they did it uh, in part by using molds. So the hands in particular, uh, just one example, could be mold made and they could be attached to the figures. Uh, the faces, were were made separately. We saw that. Then they can be easily attached to the bodies. Uh, while the clay was still moist, individual artists tweaked the facial features. So it can be said with truth that each and every one of the 8,000 soldiers placed underground to support the first emperor in the next world is actually unique or has a portrait-like quality, although we're not going to call these portraits because they're not uh, specific enough. These are shots of the burial mound of the first emperor. Uh, the estimated heights I have come in around 250 feet. Uh, suffice it to say it's a substantial hill or a small mountain, a foothill essentially, and that's what people took it to be, a foothill of the mountains beyond it, uh, which is why it uh, was unlooted, or at least part of the reason it went unlooted uh, throughout history until it was discovered uh, by a farmer who was digging for a well in the 1970s. And it was at that point that excavations began. Uh, there were historical texts that talked about this uh, and said that the first emperor was buried basically with, um, I'm going to say, a miniature city or a palace to support him, uh, with lights that would illuminate him for eternity, as well as rivers that flowed through the landscapes. Uh, the rivers were said in the, the writings, uh, the historical writings, to be rivers made out of mercury. Uh, no one seemed to believe that this could possibly have been true. Now that we've found the 8,000 soldiers in support of the history of the first emperor, tests have been taken of this artificial mountain. And guess what? Mercury has been detected. So folks, the good stuff uh, is located here. Uh, we do not know if and when the Chinese will excavate. Uh, this is a sacred burial site for the first emperor of China. This is a diagram of the first emperor's tomb, and what I'd like you to see in particular are the two walls. Uh, the tomb itself was surrounded by double walls, and that would be typical of what we would find back in the day uh, for a city in ancient China, two, essentially two protective walls. Uh, there are a series of buried items, including human remains. Uh, we believe some of these were, were the workers who uh, actually engaged in creating this as well as artworks that are buried both in and beyond the walls of the tomb of the first emperor. Among those, I'm going to give you a bronze goose, which I just think is particularly cool. Uh, it's one of a number of, uh, in this case, birds that were crafted in a kind of um, 
I'm going to say animal park that seems to have been intended to go to the afterlife to serve the first emperor. Oh, another object that is one of the stunning pieces that has been excavated from this site is the uh, chariot driver and the horses right here. Let's take a look at those. <laughs> 